One of the things you find as you get more involved in this is God has given an extraordinary number of very gifted people and uh, people that I would almost put, well, on the genius level when it comes to these kinds of things. And Dr. Greenway has certainly been um, at the forefront of that and him and his team have just done marvelously. So one more time, would you put your hands together in appreciation for, for Dr. Greenway and his team. The chair now recognizes Daniel Patterson, who is the in interim president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission for their report. Thank you, Mr. President. Brothers and sisters, my name is Daniel Patterson and I am the interim president of your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. And I stand here today as one who uh, really never expected to give a report like this, but as one who's grateful for the opportunity to talk about the work that you have entrusted to us as your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. And as we stand here today in Nashville, Tennessee, we're surrounded by country music labels, we're surrounded by country music history. And thinking about that as a Tennessean, it reminded me of another Tennessean, that legendary philosopher, Dolly Parton. Yeah, you thought Russell Moore was the only one who could do country music references. Dolly Parton said, one time in life, you need to find out who you are and be that on purpose. Find out who you are, she said, and do it on purpose. And as I thought about it, reminding us of who we are, reminding the outside world of who we are, so we can live that way on purpose, on mission together, is exactly what you've asked your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission to do. And that starts first and foremost, not in courts or in the halls of Congress, but rather where everything in Southern Baptist life is designed to start, in the pews of our churches. And sometimes so this looks like producing content for our churches, which we have. Everything from moving pro-life documentaries to articles and essays, podcasts, explainers, legal analyses, and so on. But sometimes this looks like doing what we can to address the real and present crises that threaten to tear us apart. In some cases, it's being willing to speak to the issues of racism and justice and the very real pain that many of our brothers and sisters experience. In other cases, it looks like continuing to press for measures in our churches and our denominational structures to combat sexual abuse and to make our churches safe because our response to this issue shows the world who we are and what we really believe. If we believe our God is a God who cares for the vulnerable, then so will we, no matter the cost. If we care more about shepherding than about status, then we'll show it, no matter the press. But to do that, it is imperative that we do not yield to the patterns of the world seen in society and social media that seek to make us more like them, characterized by falsehoods, and cruelty and performative outrage on behalf of one's tribe. Brothers and sisters, we will never show the world a gospel that washes sins white as snow if the way we engage with one another is red in tooth and claw. And the reality is, the last year and the pandemic we've all had to endure has allowed conflict and chaos to gain a foothold in many of our churches. And it's left so many of our pastors feeling bruised and exhausted. That's why every single day we've worked to provide resources to encourage pastors, to help churches to reopen safely, to host discussions with world-class medical professionals to talk about vaccines and the ethics behind them. It's why we've worked behind the scenes and in the courts to ensure as best we can that religious liberty be preserved alongside peace and public health. At the same time, the work of the ERLC often includes standing against harmful legislation like the Equality Act, which we have, or championing pro-life legislation like the Born Alive Protection Act, which we have. We've done the same at the state level, working on pro-life initiatives in Kentucky and Ohio and elsewhere. That's because we believe what we sing, that Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. And we believe Satan hates children. He hates children because these little ones, each new little one, reminds him of a conquering army that is being called together in Christ. It reminds him of another little one born of a virgin. It reminds him of another little one who is no longer little, who is no longer dead. 
and will return in a robe dipped in blood and feel Satan under his heel. That, brothers and sisters, is exactly why we have tripled down on our efforts to protect defenseless preborn children and their mothers in crisis. To the abortion industry, these children and their mothers are nothing but prey to be exploited and nothing but revenue streams on Planned Parenthood's balance sheet. This is wickedness of the highest order, and it is quite literally satanic. But as Paul writes, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, and we have devices of our own, literally, ultrasound machines to combat his attempts to deceive and exploit women. These machines bring a different word, a word of truth, a word that speaks to the conscience, a word that peels the seductive veneer off of Satan's false promises. And that's why I'm so proud of ERLC's Psalm 139 project. Over the last 20 years, this ministry has placed two dozen ultrasound machines around the country. This means, by God's grace, we've been able to place normally one or two machines per year. But earlier this year, we felt a God-given restlessness to do more. So we talked together among ourselves as a team, and we made a public announcement. We're not going to do one machine this year. We're not going to do two machines this year. Let's place 10, and let's do it in the next six months. And when we did, we weren't exactly sure how or if we were going to get there, but the outpouring of support and commitment to protecting unborn children from Southern Baptist has been nothing short of remarkable. We were so grateful just earlier this month to partner with Rick Wheeler and the Florida Baptist Foundation to place a machine in Pensacola, Florida at a clinic that was right on the precipice of closing its doors. Over the last few months, we've placed machines in Rock Hill, South Carolina, Tallahassee, Florida, Knoxville, Tennessee, and others. And others are starting to notice. In fact, right here in Tennessee, our Governor Bill Lee and the state government itself have seen the work we're doing and asked to come alongside us asking the ERLC to identify clinics where they can provide ultrasound machines. And this one partnership with the state of Tennessee will lead to at least seven ultrasound machines being placed across the state in the coming months. So as I stand here today, I'm happy to tell you that not only have we met our goal of placing 10 machines in, t in six months, we've surpassed it. As of this month, we have placed or finalized 11 machines around the country, and we're on pace to place 20 or 25 machines by the end of the year. If so, that means your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission will have placed in one year the same number of ultrasound machines that this ministry has placed across its entire existence. And to that, I say two things. First, praise God. And second, we have absolutely no intention of slowing down. And as many of you know, coming in January 2023 is Roe 50, the 50th anniversary of the infamous Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. Imagine the possibilities if we as Southern Baptists use this moment to leverage our energy and work together to save lives and serve women. One thing we could do is something bold. One thing we could do is something with life-saving implications. And that's exactly what your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission exists and is planning to do. So as I stand here today, I stand here to announce a new goal for your ERLC. Our goal is to place 50 ultrasound machines around the country by January of 2023. 50 by row 50. And I want to encourage you to join with us to consider how you could be a part of providing this life-saving technology, of supporting these clinics that offer not just life, but real and Christ-exalting ministry to women in crisis, to join us to say to a watching world, we serve a God who rejoices in life and brings about newness of life through the hope and the offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Southern Baptist, let's stand for life. And as we do, we remind ourselves of what we're here to do all along, to share the hope and the mercy and the grace and the gospel of Christ. And that's what your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission exists to do. So brothers and sisters, that's why we're here, to help Southern Baptists carry out the Great Commission. We are a commission in service to the Great Commission, and on behalf of your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, let me say thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you to equip our churches, to speak to the watching world, to help us remember who we are in Christ so we can live that way on purpose. 
Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Mr. President. And to conclude our report, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Prince, Chairman of the ERLC Board of Trustees, to come and provide a brief update. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Uh, before I say anything else, I want to say how thankful I am that Dr. Patterson has agreed to be our acting president. Even as you've heard here today, we are blessed to have his leadership in these moments. Mr. President, fellow messengers and guests, I'm honored to stand here on behalf of the trustees to give a brief word of report about your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. You know, this has been a difficult time and a challenging time. This has been a difficult time for all of us, and we have faced our challenges. But your Ethic and Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission team has worked diligently and carried out its ministry assignment in the midst of it all without missing a beat. I want you to know that your Ethics and Religious Liberty team are glad-hearted gospel warriors, that they have been working relentlessly, as you've just heard, to save lives, to uphold human dignity, to promote religious liberty, and to carry the gospel into the public square with conviction and kindness that is unparalleled. I have been astounded in the midst of all the challenges that they have faced at their resiliency to do so. And it's been that way for the last eight years. Dr. Russell Moore led the ERLC in a time of political, cultural, and yes, sometimes denominational chaos. And he did so with a commitment to the Bible as God's inerrant word and God's all-sufficient word for us. I'm thankful for his integrity. I'm thankful for his courage. And I'm thankful for his convictional kindness that he modeled while he was the leader of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. Amen. While we owe him a debt of gratitude, it's obviously a time that the commission is now beginning a transition. We were stunned to learn of his decision to leave the ERLC. But I want you to know that the ERLC is needed more than it has ever been needed. In this time of ethical compromise, in this time of moral chaos and confusion, and in this time of constant assaults on religious liberty, we need the ERLC to be a mighty force for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as chairman of the Board of Trustees, I want Southern Baptists to know that we are committed to identify the individual who is equipped and prepared to speak from the truth of the gospel to the consciences of elected leaders, public officials, and the watching world. And we know, we know that the ultimate place of power is in local churches. It's not in the halls of Congress, and it's not even in the White House, that the church is God's witness in the world, and that everything we do ultimately is to have the Great Commission in view. This board and the search committee that will be announced in the coming weeks is going to prayerfully and methodically conduct a national search to find the individual as the proper set of leadership capabilities to guide the organization into its bright future. And as with recent searches for SBC entity heads, we expect this to take many months. And I want to ask something from you. I want you to join us in praying. Join us in praying for God to lead us to the next leader praying for the ERLC staff in this time of transition. It's vital that this organization know and feel the support of the entire Southern Baptist Convention family as we embark on this important journey. And I want you to know that your input is needed and your support is vital to this process, Southern Baptist. With that, Mr. President, if there are any questions, we're happy to entertain them. Thank you, David Prince and Dr. Daniel Patterson. I know um, a heavy mantle has fallen upon you and your trustees over the last week or so, and we are very grateful for the way that you have taken it and, and, and begun to lead through it. Um, at this time, may, in, we will entertain questions here for um, either David or, uh, or Daniel at, uh, on behalf of the ERLC. 8A. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Dale Torres, messenger from First Baptist Church in Patterson, California. My question is for those representing the ERLC. On page 191 in the book of reports, 
the ERLC report states, and I quote, the ERLC has consistently and repeatedly advocated that the state treat churches the same as similar activities, businesses, and spaces consistent with the First Amendment protections. While recognizing that God has given the state authority to manage activities, businesses, and spaces during a national health crisis. Is it then the opinion of the ERLC that there is such an activity or business on earth that is similar or the same as the assembly of the saints on the Lord's day in obedience to him? And if so, can you cite an example of such a business or activity that is the same as the church of God? And if it's not the opinion of the ERLC, then why did you consistently and repeatedly argue that way? Thank you. Well, brother, I appreciate that question, and I'm happy to talk about our approach. Um, generally, what I would say is when we're talking about the legal question, we're talking about, number one, what, how should we approach this issue generally? So we start from the theological conviction that no government is Lord over the church. No government has authority to rule. The power of the keys has been given to the church. So we start from that principle number one. Principle number two is that the spheres of church and state are to be kept separate. There is hardly anything more foundational to Baptist convictions shy of the gospel other than our commitment to religious liberty and of a free church and a free state, as the Baptist Faith and Message puts it. So beyond that, we would also say that the state has real but limited authority. And the protection of public health is one of those things that is given over to the government. So we have been through a very long year, and some of these issues have become contentious, and some of these issues have become complicated. But one of those things that we have to press, and we do try and press strictly and as broadly as we humanly can, is that when governments approach churches trying to exercise the authority that we believe is God-given to protect the citizenry, they must legally have a compelling state interest and use the least restrictive means possible. So, for example, when we go to places, uh, we, you know, we filed a, a brief in Nevada, Nevada, for example, where casinos were open but churches were not allowed to be open. So we're not saying that existentially casinos and churches are the same thing, but when you're allowing assemblies of one kind and you're saying to churches, you're not allowed to meet because you're a church and implicitly you're not bringing revenue into the state, we're not going to allow you to meet. So what we're saying in those cases is that the government should not act in such a way. The government should be fair, the government should be neutral, religious liberty should be recognized, and churches should be seen for what they are as not subjects or not extensions of the state, but free within a free society, and that's what we've pushed for repeatedly. Thank you very much for your question. A question on microphone 2A. I'm Matthew Broman for First Baptist Church Sykeston, and I am thankful for your incredible pro-life stance. Thank you, brother. Um, and I'm thankful that you defend victims. And I'm thankful as a convention that we've stood with you with our motion. But I am not thankful that you can't get control of your letters and you're letting people release audio do you have a way to control that because that was offensive last week well i appreciate the question brother and i can tell you before my uh, previous role uh, as your acting president of your erlc i served as vice president for operations and chief of staff where i managed the president's office and served our board of trustees and also extensively worked with national media outlets i've i've worked in pr for the better part of my adult career and i can say with all honesty integrity and total truthfulness i have never leaked or been a part of a leak in my entire life and i don't know a single person on our team who would or did and i i do not have any idea how those letters got out uh, they shouldn't have 
and uh, at the same time, uh, the truth in them uh, and the sentiments in them grieved me. Uh, so I, I wish I had more answers for you on that, but I can tell you that that was not coming from your Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission staff, but I appreciate the question nonetheless. Thank you, Dr. Patterson, and the time that has been allotted for the ERLC report and questions has expired. And so thank you, Dr. Dr. Patterson and David Prince and your team. And uh, the chair recognizes Ben Mandrell, president and CEO of LifeWay Christian